Hello, and welcome to Topic 4. This is Dr. Hancock, and I'm happy to give you an overview this week of your content, which is going to cover management challenges in healthcare. There's four outcomes which you should accomplish in this week's module. The first is that you'll be able to explain the four most important hospital strategies for value-based payment implementation. Second, you'll be able to articulate major challenges affecting healthcare organizations in the contemporary environment. Third, you'll be able to synthesize ways as a manager to promote patient value while achieving quality, safety, and cost effectiveness. And fourth, you'll identify and use performance measurement methods. If you have the Legere and Dunham Taylor textbook, you'll read chapter four. And if you have Baker, Baker, and Dworkin, you'll read chapter 27. The content on these slides comes from both the textbooks and other resources that I've pulled together for you. Legere, Dunham, Taylor define the top four challenges in contemporary healthcare as those on this slide. Chapter four of their textbook spends a good amount of time discussing how healthcare providers can discover what patients really want and value. Historically, health decisions have been very paternalistic and driven by physicians. Doctors have simply told patients what must be done and patients were expected to obey. This has resulted in terms like compliance and non-compliance with doctor's orders. Today's patients may prefer to be active participants in their own care. The idea of informed consent has shifted to become shared decision-making between patients and their care providers. This means we cannot assume all patients want the same outcomes, and there has to be an ongoing effort to identify patient wants and values at both the individual and system levels. Quality in healthcare means different things to different people. Most of our standard definitions have ignored patient wants and values, and instead they focused on the perspective of healthcare professionals or regulators. We tend to measure quality by performance on technical standards in healthcare. We look at things like readmission rates, hospital acquired infection rates, length of stay, and the number of procedures performed. These are examples of some technical standards. These types of quality measures used in most hospital reporting systems, although we are beginning to see things like patient satisfaction scores as equally as important. The third challenge here, after patient wants and values and quality, is to keep the patient safe. This seems like a no-brainer, Safety means that no patient should be injured or become ill as a result of their healthcare experience. The final challenge in healthcare, and perhaps our biggest one, is to accomplish these first three items in a cost effective way. We need to provide safe, quality care in accordance with what our patients want and value, and control costs. Our healthcare organizations and managers are struggling with this one. In previous modules, you explored the performance of the U.S. healthcare system and some of its problems overall. We looked at the fact that the U.S. spends more per capita than any other country, yet yields thir third world outcomes when you look at things like mortality and morbidity rates. Our care is often fragmented and depersonalized, and unintentional harm to patients is common with both medication errors and other types of illnesses and injuries that result from the patient being in our healthcare system. Patient needs and values that we just talked about are often not considered in plans of care. To illustrate these concepts, and particularly that of fragmented and depersonalized care, I encourage you to read a personal story from Sue Hossmiller of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. I've posted her story on Canvas, and it's where she speaks of being a family member in the hospital system when her husband was in critical care. It gives you a good first-person view into some of these problems. How can we do better? Creating a better future healthcare system requires leadership, planning, and change management. In 2011, the American Hospital Association 
recommended 10 must-do strategies for hospitals to prepare for a future consumer-driven, value-based marketplace. These strategies are outlined in a report called Hospitals and Care Systems of the Future. These four are identified as the most important hospital strategies for value-based payment implementation. Other types of healthcare organizations can also benefit from prioritizing these strategies. The first priority addresses the need for seamless patient care across the continuum. Too often, if you work in a single setting like a hospital or a home health care or a clinic, you don't necessarily consider what your patient has done before they arrived in your facility or what's going to happen to them afterwards. We all need to more proactively address how we can care for our patients no matter what setting they're in. The second priority set forth by the American Hospital Association proclaims the use of evidence-based practice to improve quality and safety. The third priority is improved efficiency. It's well known that unnecessary operational inefficiency is a significant source of healthcare costs. Improved efficiency will help reduce costs and also to decrease more timely care, to increase care that is timely to the patient. The final top priority for hospitals in preparation for the value-based market is to develop integrated information systems. Technological advances have contributed significantly to the increasing cost of our health care, but it is evident that data have to be readily available for analysis and improvement work. How do patients and healthcare providers know what quality means in healthcare? One framework that we can use to explain and educate our patients about quality is the Institute of Medicine, or IOM, Domains of Improvement. The Domains of Improvement allow you to lump healthcare initiatives and outcomes into domains that are easily explained and then can be shared internally and with patients and their families. The six domains of improvement suggested by the Institute of Medicine are safe. Healthcare should avoid harm to patients from care that is intended to help them. Should be effective, providing services based on scientific knowledge to all who could benefit and refraining from providing services to those who are not likely to benefit. Effective care avoids underuse and misuse of healthcare services. Patient-centered. This means providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensuring that patient values guide all of our clinical decisions. Timely. Reducing waits and sometimes harmful delays for both those who receive and those who give care. Efficient. Avoiding waste including waste of equipment, supplies, ideas, and energy. And equitable. Equitable care means care that does not vary in quality because of personal characteristics such as gender, ethnicity, geographic location, or socioeconomic status. Frameworks like these IOM domains make it easier for patients to grasp the meaning and the relevance of quality measures Studies have shown that providing people with the framework for understanding quality helps them value a broader range of quality indicators. When technical performance measures are grouped into these user-friendly domains, patients can see the meaning of the measures and how it more clearly relates to their own concerns about their care. Quality improvement and healthcare redesign are critical for our nation's health and well being, as well as for our financial solvency. The IOM proposed 10 fundamental rules for managers to follow when redesigning healthcare delivery in organizations and communities. These rules are important to keep in mind in all your management decisions. Care should be based on continuous healing relationships. Patients should receive care whenever they need it, and in many forms, not just through face-to-face -face visits. 
the healthcare system should be responsive at all times and access to care should be provided over the internet, by telephone, and by other means in addition to face-to-face -face visits. Care should be customized based on the patient's needs and values. The system of care should be designed to meet the most common needs, but should also have the flexibility to respond to an individual patient's choices and preferences. Patients should be in control. Patients should be given necessary information and the opportunity to exercise as much control as they choose over the healthcare decisions that affect them. The health system should be able to accommodate differences in patient preferences and should encourage shared decision making. The system should encourage shared knowledge and the free flow of information. Patients should have unfettered access to their own information and to clinical information. Clinicians and patients should communicate effectively and share information. Decision making should be evidence based. This means patients should receive care based on the best available scientific knowledge. Care should not vary illogically from clinician to clinician or from place to place. Safety should be a property of the system. Patients should be safe from injury caused by the care system. Reducing risk and ensuring safety will require systems that help prevent and mitigate errors. The system should be transparent. The healthcare system should make information available to patients and their families that allows them to make informed decisions when selecting a health plan, a hospital, a clinical practice, or when choosing among alternative treatments. Patients should be informed in the systems of the system's performance on safety, evidence-based practice, and patient satisfaction. The system should anticipate patient needs. It should be proactive, not reactive. The system should constantly strive to decrease waste. The healthcare system should not waste resources or our patients' time. And finally, the healthcare system should encourage cooperation among clinicians. Clinicians and institutions should actively collaborate and communicate with each other to ensure that patients receive appropriate care. These rules came out in 2001. So it's been 16 years. How are we doing? When I look at these rules, it seems to me that we still have quite a long ways to go. Since 2001, 10 more rules were suggested by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the IHI Leadership Alliance. This is a group of around 40 healthcare organizations who are committed to achieving care better than we've ever seen health better than we've ever known and at a cost we can all afford. In the first year of their alliance, they reviewed the 10 simple rules promoted by the Institute of Medicine for redesigning the healthcare system, and they asked themselves, what new rules do we need now to address our current set of challenges in healthcare, even though we haven't necessarily solved all the old ones? As a result, they developed guiding principles for healthcare transformation, which they call the 10 new rules for radical redesign in healthcare. Here are the rules they propose. First, change the balance of power. Co-produce health and well-being in partnership with patients, families, and communities. Number two, standardize what makes sense. Standardize what is possible to reduce unnecessary variation and increase the time available for individualized care. Three, customize care to the individual. Contextualize care to an individual patient's needs, values, and preference, guided by an understanding of what matters to the person in addition to what's the medical problem. Four, promote well-being. Focus on outcomes that matter the most to people appreciating that their health and happiness may not require health care at all. This is much like the change in psychology where they've now promote positive psychology instead of looking at diagnoses of what's wrong. Number five, create joy in work. Cultivate and mobilize the pride and joy of the healthcare workforce. It's interesting, isn't it, that previous rules didn't really seem to care about the workforce at all, 
but as of 2015, healthcare leaders are recognizing that the healthcare workforce is an integral part of healthcare services and that joy in our work matters and actually improves the care we provide. Number six, make it easy. Continually reduce waste and all non-value added requirements and activities for patients, families, and clinicians. Seven, move knowledge, not people. Exploit all helpful capacities of modern digital care and continually substitute better alternatives for visits and institutional stays. Meet people where they are, literally. For some of us, that means being able to call or email our phone, our providers using our smartphones, or to look up lab, lab results online. Um, for many people, technology is a great solution, but not for everybody, especially in some of our rural areas um, and older patients, they may not have the internet access or the capability of managing those systems. So we still have to meet everyone where they are. Number eight. Collaborate and communicate. Recognize that the healthcare system is embedded in a network that extends beyond walls. Eliminate silos within healthcare and tear down self protective institutional or professional boundaries that impede flow and responsiveness to the patient. Number nine, assume abundance. Use all the assets that can help to optimize the social, economic, and physical environment, especially the assets that are brought by patients, their families, and their communities. And number 10, return the money. Return the money from healthcare savings to other public and private purposes. I have to admit, I like these 10 new rules a lot, although when I look at healthcare facilities in my area, it seems we have a very long way to go to truly put all of these rules into practice. It's a big challenge that I'm throwing to you all as future healthcare managers. We're gonna shift gears now for a minute and talk specifically about performance management systems. Performance management first became popular in healthcare in the 1990s. It started when employers shopped for health plans to offer their employees. Employers wanted to examine cost and quality data to see which health plan was best for their dollar spent. Then later, the concept of performance management spread into healthcare organizations and they started developing their own in-house report cards in order to improve their services. In recent years, there's been a rapidly growing interest in performance and quality improvement within healthcare. Different names and labels are often used to describe similar concepts or activities. Other sectors like industry and hospitals have embraced a diverse and evolving set of terms, but which generally have the same principles at heart, getting better over time. So things you hear like continuous quality improvement, quality improvement, performance improvement, quality management, performance measurement, Six Sigma, total quality management, they all generally mean gathering data and analyzing the data to improve performance over time. The basic idea behind performance management systems in healthcare is that patient outcomes can be used to determine whether the organization is performing effectively. Although this practice is better than in the past, when patient outcomes were not tracked at all, it still has its flaws. The first is that you cannot predict future performance based on history. The number of infection rates in a hospital last year, for example, certainly does not determine the number of infections they're going to have this year. Performance management systems typically do not include patient wants and values in their data, as we've already talked about. Some organizations are actually drowning in data. They collect lots of information on everything, but they don't have the time or the resources to analyze it, to determine what's important or how to use it. Another problem is that in many cases, data has only been used to document problems that result in negative consequences or punishment, instead of using the data to celebrate success or to plan for future improvement. As organizations begin to collect more data, the Joint Commission, an accreditation agency for hospitals, 
expanded their prefer performance measurement rules, which you may know as the Joint Commission core and non-core measures. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, also begin requiring certain data sets from hospitals, long-term care agencies, and home health care. Information about how healthcare organizations perform on these core and non-core measures is now available online to the public. The CMS was the first agency to provide performance reports to the public so that patients can literally compare hospitals, physicians, nursing homes, and home health agencies. Today, there are a number of other public and private sources of healthcare performance information. I've posted a link for you to the Robert Ward Johnson Foundation's resource, which is called Comparing Healthcare Quality. This is a national directory of resources where you can look at performance indicators from healthcare providers and organizations. Some of it is national level, some of it is state level. I encourage you to check out the website and see what's available for your community. As you've learned, once healthcare organizations started reporting data on outcomes to the CMS, it wasn't long before the CMS started to use that data to institute pay for performance or value based programs. The goal is to reward providers who meet or exceed expectations and to punish those who do not by withholding or restricting dollars. What CMS does is very important because CMS represents more than 50% of health insurance in this country, including the Medicare and Medicaid systems. CMS has been a leader in requiring healthcare agencies to report health outcomes and to tie reimbursement to performance. Private insurance companies are now beginning to follow suit. Healthcare organizations collect data to comply with regulatory requirements but they also collect and use data for internal reasons, as we've discussed when we were talking about performance measurement. One concept that I wanted to introduce to you is that of the balanced scorecard. The balanced scorecard is a strategic planning and, measure and management system that many organizations use in order to communicate what they're trying to accomplish, align the day-to-day -day work that everyone is doing with the overall business strategy, and to prioritize projects, products, and services. They also use the balanced scorecard to measure and monitor the organization's progress towards its strategic long-term goals. I've posted a full explanation of balanced scorecards and how they work with some templates on Canvas, and you should read it to fully accomplish the outcomes in this module. The balanced scorecard system essentially connects the dots between big picture strategy, like an organization's mission, vision, and values, with operations. The operational measures are things like objectives, measures, which are also called key performance indicators, targets, the desired level of performance, and initiatives, which are the projects that help you meet your targets. The balanced scorecard suggests that we view the organization from four perspectives and to develop objectives, measures, targets, and initiatives relative to each one of these four points of view. The first point of view is financial, and sometimes you'll also see that called stewardship. This financial perspective views the organization's financial performance and their use of financial resources. Another perspective is that of the customer, sometimes called the stakeholder. This perspective views organizational performance from the point of view of the customer that the organization is designed to serve. In healthcare, that's typically going to be our patients, although we sometimes would call them residents or other names. Another perspective is that of the internal process. This is a way to look at organizational performance through the lens of quality and efficiency related to our products and services or other key business processes. And then the final perspective is often called learning and growing. And this is a view of organizational performance through the lens of its people or human capital, the infrastructure, technology, culture, 
and other capacities that are the key to breakthroughs in employee performance. Among each of these four perspectives, you'll see objectives, measures, targets, and initiatives. Objectives are the continuous improvement activities that we have to do to implement strategy. They break down more abstract concepts like mission and vision into actionable steps. An example of an objective might be increase revenue or improve patient satisfaction. For each objective on the strategy map, at least one measure or key performance indicator will be identified and tracked over time. Measures indicate progress toward a desirable outcome. Strategic measures monitor the implementation and effectiveness of an organization's strategies, and they determine the gap between actual performance and targeted performance, and that then helps us to determine organizational effectiveness and operational efficiency. Good measures, or KPIs, pro provide us with an objective way to see if our strategy is working. They also offer comparison data to measure the degree of performance change over time. They focus employees' attention on what matters most to success, and they allow us to measure our accomplishments. Targets are the goals or the benchmarks that we compare our measurable outcomes with. One way that organizations track measurements and compare with targets is to use run and control charts. And so in this week's practice exercise, you're going to learn more about run charts and how to use them. You're going to be diving into management challenges this week. In order to be successful and accomplish your outcomes, I encourage you to start by reading the textbook chapters that are assigned and then go item by item through the materials I've posted in Canvas lessons. I have a personal story from Sue Haasmiller that will let you kind of see what healthcare is like from a patient and family perspective. I have posted for you um, a Mayo Clinic model for running a value improvement program to give you a sense of how performance management systems can work in the hospital. I've shared with you the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation database comparing healthcare quality. And then I've posted additional learning materials to help you learn how to use balanced scorecards and run charts. And so in your assignment sections, you have two key assignments for the week. In the group discussion, you'll start by exploring a case study from the Commonwealth Fund, and you'll talk about how that case study fits into the content related to management challenges. And then your practice exercise this week will be making a run chart using Microsoft Excel. Good luck, get started early, and if you run into any problems, please email me or check in with your classmates to see how we can help you. I hope you have a wonderful week.